Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us again at another Barometer Readings webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and joining me from Glasgow, Scotland, is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President here at Barometer Capital. Dave never misses a, never likes to miss a webcast, so today's session will be unique in that you will only be hearing David. So it's an audio session um, as David waits to get his connecting flight and go on holiday. <laughs> so with that, while you can't see him, he does have a voice for radio. So over to you, David. Good Thanks, afternoon, Pamela. or rather good evening for you. Good, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I am, and I just jumped off a plane in, in Glasgow. Uh, I'm here for a few days uh, and uh, didn't want to miss this week. So I think there's lots going on in the market and things to talk about. So we're going to blast through some slides. Uh, and uh, you might you might not see my face today, but hopefully the uh, the audio will be OK. Um, market sort of continues to grapple with uh, the potential impacts of uh, a Fed tightening cycle. Uh, it also continues to deal with inflation as an issue uh, and certainly rising bond yields. And so, uh, you know, when there's a lot of change taking place, the market's got to digest it. We do our best to uh, take our message from the market and use the tools that we have uh, to try to make sure that tactically we're set up and in tune with what's going on and, and balance risk and reward. Um, these times do present opportunity, um, and uh, if we can read this correctly, uh, you know it sets us up for a, for a favorable year. We're in a good spot to start with. Uh, we've had a, a very very good year relative to markets, uh, and we're certainly balancing. You know how much risk do we want to take against you know what is the potential reward, and sometimes the discretion is a better part of valor. Just to just to walk through quickly, as you know, we believe we're in a structural bull market in equities. Uh, it's been going on since 2013. And probably like other structural bull markets, there's going to be pullbacks and corrections along the way. Uh, but this has uh, been quite typical of a structural bull market. We've seen expanded multiples over time. Uh, and we've seen sort of three steps forward with one step back uh, for equity prices. U.S. really has been leading uh, the developed world has been leading emerging markets over the last few years, uh, and, I, and I think that that is likely to continue. When we take the S&P sort of on a longer view, this is sort of the mid-80s through current. Uh, we know that since this bull market got going in 2013, we've had several you know, wobbly periods. Certainly 2020 was a tough one, fastest bear market in history. Uh, and what we've been seeing since the beginning of the year is quite typical. Uh, as to what we see during bull markets. Uh, it's more of a corrective period than anything else. And it certainly can turn into more than that. And we, we are obviously focused on making sure we don't get hurt by that if that were the case. But our base case is we continue to be in a structural bull market and it's likely to go on for you know, a long period of time. Uh, we also uh, have the view that we have gone through a watershed moment where yields have gone through a generational bottoming, having started their way lower in 1981. Uh, and, uh, and as we've often said, what works during rising rates is different than what works during falling rates. And it's not a lost cause. There's lots of things you can do in a more inflationary environment, but we do have to manage the risk of inflation and having our buying power deflated away. Um, the 10-year yields, as I think most people know, have worked their way up into the 3% range. We've run into long term downward moving averages, which we're above currently. Uh, we think things are probably a little bit stretched. When we look at the aggregate bond index, <clears throat> you know, it's moved sharply lower. This is an index of uh, issuers across maturities. And uh, since, the, since the top, down about 15%, uh, the TLT, which is the 30 year, uh, also has come down sharply about 31%. Uh, since the sell-off began. And we've been a big advocate of avoiding bonds uh, because if we have gone through a watershed move, um, we could see higher yields for quite some time. Having said that, uh, bond yields and bond, sorry, bond prices are a long way below the long-term moving averages, which have now turned down. Uh, 
uh, and uh, they could bounce at any given time. We all know that the Fed is going to raise rates this week, whether it's 50 basis points or 75, we don't know. Uh, but the bond market has been pricing this in now for several months. Um, this is, um, again, the, uh, the um, uh, aggregate bond index, and it's been obviously a very, very difficult place to be. From a structural standpoint, we also believe that we're going through, we went through a, a shift, a long-term shift in commodity prices, going from a disinflationary environment to a reflationary environment. We all know that the supply chain issues are out there. Uh, and, uh, and this is a challenge for industry as everything from copper to coal to oil <clears throat> to cotton to sugar have moved up sharply in price. These are monthly bars and we continue to work our way higher uh, in sort of an orderly way. This is an updated view of the RJI uh, ETF, which is an equally weighted basket of uh, commodities. And you can see relative to the S&P 500, now for um, quite a number of uh, months has been moving sharply higher relative to equities. And we showed charts in previous webcasts to highlight the fact that when this begins, it tends to go on for a long time, which is why we have spent lots of time talking about commodities and the ways that we can exploit higher prices. When you go through a long bear market, often there is structural underinvestment in capacity and it just happens in this case, we already had an issue with rising commodity prices. And then of course, the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, emerged and probably exacerbated that situation. So no real sign of that changing. And when we hear talk about recession, it's not to say we can't see recession due to rising rates uh, and inflation. It really is not having a significant impact on commodity prices at this point. Um, we think that it is a structural bias that prices will work their way higher and they'll be in fits and starts uh, and certainly have corrections. We've consolidated here, you can see since February, uh, but we think that this is a reality that we're going to be dealing with for quite some time because there is rising demand in general as the pandemic around the world is, is sort of um, um, kind of like gone to a simmer uh, and people are moving around more. There's going to be lots of investment. And we think that we've moved from a world of just-in-time inventories to just-in-case inventories. In other words, companies are likely to build stockpiles of supplies because they can't afford to go through these bottlenecks. And it also probably means there's going to have to be fairly significant investment in new capacity, and it takes time for that all to come on. If we just take a quick run through it, this is the uh, oil ETF USO. You can see the relative strength versus the S&P really rising sharply. We certainly have consolidated a little bit since February, uh, uh, but you can see all of the long-term moving averages working the way higher. We've seen a series of higher lows, and this has big implications for industry. Now, it tends to be that prices, when they consolidate in this sort of a triangle or flag pattern, they tend to exit from those patterns the way they entered. So if we came in from underneath, we're likely to exit from the upside. So we think that there is upside still in oil prices and oil equities. And that's something that we're keeping a close eye on as it relates to other industries that get hurt by rising oil prices. These are, this is the ETF for gasoline. We're heading into the driving season in the US. Uh, inventories are quite low. Again, we see rising relative strength versus equities. Uh, this is something that we're keeping a close eye on. And these are agricultural commodities. And you can see we made a new relative strength high today versus the S&P. So despite the fact that we've seen pretty sloppy equity markets over the last few weeks, really commodities bull market continues. Now it may be that we've seen some pullback in the shares of commodity producing companies, but the underlying base case of higher commodity prices does not appear to be waning. Um, this is uh, the corn ETF you know, going on to make new highs recently. We've seen a little pullback in the base metals ETF DBB. This is made up of a basket of different industrial metals. But again, uh, nicely uh, higher, moving higher in, uh, in the long term moving averages. So this is the S&P. <clears throat> you can see we talked over the last few weeks about whether or not the S&P would be able to hold above this low from late February. Now the S&P sort of off the highs at the low point down about 15 and a half percent. On Monday, we broke these lows from 
February, but in the same day was able to recapture it, closing back above those lows. So we now really have a line in the sand. Uh, it's not impossible that the market, once the Fed comes out with its decision, could rally off that, that the market, the news is in the market. Um, but we also have a line in the sand that says if we were to take out the low from Monday, probably we go a little bit lower. So you know that our breadth models have been more cautious on equities, uh, certainly uh, uh, in the US and in emerging markets. The Canadian equity markets have outperformed, uh, but it's possible given the fact we're down 15% uh, that we're coming into the later stages of this corrective phase. It's important to remember that the high growth tech stocks have now been correcting for an, or in a bear market for 14 months. Uh, and the real impact on the S&P has been large cap tech stocks, uh, the Netflix uh, and Amazons of the world. And of course, that's had a bigger impact in the NASDAQ 100. And the NASDAQ 100 did clearly break the lows uh, from February and March. Again, we've, we've briefly reclaimed it, but we really haven't made any progress at this point. I think at the worst point, down about 24%. So... We continue to be very cautious relative strength versus the S&P has been waning. Now, remember that in the period since 2008, where growth has been weak and interest rates exceedingly low, growth was at a premium. And there's if you took out the six companies in the S&P 500, which are the six key FANG stocks, in fact, the S&P hasn't really done any better than the rest of the world stock markets, other than the positive impact of those very large growth stocks. If we've gone through a watershed event where rates are higher and inflation is higher structurally, it's not impossible that uh, these could continue to underperform for some time. So I know that everybody wants to know when these things may get going again. And they certainly had you know, a nice reversal uh, early in the week this week, uh, but really nothing has changed. This continues to be a weak spot in the market. Until that changes, we're unlikely to have much by way of weight. Of course, the ARC ETF is the poster child for high growth tech, making a high in January of 2021. And here we are now, you know, the ARC ETF uh, is down very, very sharply, almost 70% off the highs. So look, we, we just have to apply our process. We have, we have three basic pieces to our process uh, uh, with, a, with a basic view that the, that the data shows uh, 80% of return comes from being in the right asset classes. So say commodities or equities or fixed income. Within the asset class, finding the sectors or themes that have some kind of a structural tailwind that can help revalue that industry. And then uh, a 20% of return is finding the right securities. And so we use our top-down model to try and identify pockets of the market we want to focus in where we know there is a tailwind, where we know there's expanding breadth, uh, and then we use uh, our bottom-up work to try to identify companies with fundamental and technical characteristics that point to something changing for the better. So if we can find areas of market leadership and they line up with securities that meet our business tests, that's where our portfolio lives. And then we run inventory management by uh, having a disciplined selling strategy. The things that work uh, will stay in and add to the things that stop working or start to decline. We have a risk budget. Uh, we'll use a stop loss, which will take us to the sidelines, which is how we wind up with virtually no tech. It's how we wind up with virtually no consumer discretionary stocks currently, because those groups have been under pressure now for quite some time. So from a top-down perspective, as we've always talked about, after a decline, we look for expanding breadth or the percentage of stocks and uptrends should be expanding more and more stocks participating in a rally, that's a healthy market. When we see deterioration in bread, that doesn't mean we're gonna sell everything, but if it's in a specific sector, it means we stop making any new purchases. And if we get stopped out of existing positions or new money comes in, it's gonna stay in cash. So when we get into a persistently weak market, it turns out our cash position will build and we'll wind up naturally with less exposure. And it's not the first three or four weeks of a decline that hurts you. It's if the market winds up in a bear market the last months and months, uh, and we just can't afford to let little mistakes turn into big mistakes. Okay, So 
We always are willing to take defensive measures. It's not about what we think should happen. It's about using the tools that we have to measure what is happening and make constant small adjustments in the portfolios. So here we are. Um, we talked last week about the fact that our big models, percentage of stocks in uptrends in Canada, in the NYSE, and globally has been deteriorating, which means we are loath to put on new positions. Our short-term indicators, percent of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average, has been falling. Doesn't mean there's none that are trading above the 50-day. There's lots. But the universe is much smaller, and it's been getting smaller over the last few weeks. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum or upward trajectory has been weakening. The percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows has been weakening. And the percent of stocks trading about their 150 day or 30 week moving average has been deteriorating. So all of this just says to us, we need to be playing a little bit of defense. And markets can turn at any time. It may well be that when the Fed raises rates this week, which has been well telegraphed, the market will breathe a sigh of relief and we'll see a relief rally. But we don't know if that will happen or when it will happen. So we have to take it step by step. We talked about the fact that the percent of stocks and uptrends globally has been weakening uh, in, in the NYSE. So that just means we've got some dry powder. Now let's just run through our leadership groups to see if anything has changed dramatically that would cause us to get even more defensive. Let's start out with energy because as you know, it's been our largest weight uh, in the mid 20% range in the average portfolio and nothing is changing here. This is the Canadian XEG ETF. Uh, it's made up of companies from uh, uh, Canadian Natural Resources and Suncor down to companies like Tourmaline. <clears throat> but look at this, it just continues to be on a tear. The relative strength made a new relative strength high today. And that's against what has been a fairly sloppy market. Now, one would expect if we are headed into some kind of imminent recession, you would be seeing this back off and we are not seeing that. So there is a structural shortage that has been in the market for some time due to underinvestment. Energy has underperformed since 2014. <clears throat> and really since November of 2020 has been working its way higher in a very orderly way. So energy became a very small part of the index after the index falling 70%. And we think we are in a structural bull market that can go on a long time, oil producers, gas producers, service companies, and so on. And this is why we have fairly significant holdings, especially because at the prices we're seeing currently, the cash flow being generated by these companies is substantial. And these companies now have found religion and are prepared to return capital to shareholders by way of share buybacks and dividends and distributions. Uh, and we think that this is this is an area that arguably can go a lot higher. Um, hopefully, we can get some resolution in the Ukraine, but it doesn't realistically look like it's happening anytime soon. And it's not impossible that we could see an outright embargo uh, by European countries on European oil and gas, which would move prices sharply higher. So we have to protect against inflation. We have to own things that that will will help offset inflation. And by owning investments in this space, uh, you know, I think it's an important part of a portfolio to hedge us. This is the XOP index, which is the U.S. producers. Same thing, sharply rising relative strength. Nothing changing here that would say we are headed into some kind of imminent recession. The materials uh, uh, ETF, FX said, this was made up of everything from steel companies to uh, um, fertilizer companies, made a new relative strength high today. This continues to act well. It doesn't mean it doesn't have little pullbacks, had a sharp pullback uh, uh, two weeks ago, but we're trading you know, pretty close to highs. Uh, and of course, relative to the rest of the market, behaving extremely well. This is the, this is the agricultural companies. So the John Deere's and Bears and Nutrients of the world, again, relative strength has been very, very strong, certainly pulled back into support over the last couple of weeks, uh, but relative to a very weak stock market performing quite well. There's Nutrien, which reported their earnings this week, <clears throat> not only met expectations, but guided to higher cash flow for next year than the street was expecting by almost 20%. So 
So this we think again is a, an important holding, it's the largest holding in the firm. When we look at the very long-term picture of this MOO ETF, the Vanek Agri Agribusiness ETF, it's a pretty clear picture. After a long period of underperformance going back to the early 2010s, uh, when we broke out in 2020, we started a period higher and there have been consolidations, but these are monthly bars. We continue to put in higher lows month by month and it continues to march higher. It's not for us to guess when this is gonna stop, but we think that once you're into a bull market here, it can go on for quite some time. This is the GUNR <coughs> ETF. Uh, this is made up of um, major producers of commodities. So it's corporations that produce metals, that produce fertilizer, that produce steel. Uh, this is an ETF that has a 3.4% dividend. It's been growing its dividend at over 20%. Again, a sharp pullback, and that marks a bull market. Steady advances with sharp pullbacks is what happens in the bull market. And again, well above the 150 and 200 day moving average continues to, to act well, impacted by a weaker market, certainly, uh, but one that's, that's holding in quite well. Um, and, and this is the metals and mining ETF. Again, long-term picture uh, going back many, many years to the early uh, 2000 teens. Uh, after breaking out in 2020 and consolidating, started to move higher. And again, natural pullback in the rising moving average, nothing changing here. Okay, um, thematically, value continues to outperform. So in a world where rates are moving higher, growth stocks tend to be devalued or re-rated. And value which tends to be more, more companies that have operating leverage to rising prices tends to do a little better. So you can look at the list of the largest holdings here, but companies like Archer Daniels, Mosaic, uh, MetLife, Allstate, some, uh, some basic materials companies like Westrock, uh, rising relative strength made a new relative strength high today. And again, certainly pulled back a little bit, but it's trading well above the long-term moving averages again, consolidating, but continues to be quite constructive. So value continues to lead growth. And then of course the dividend theme, which we've spent a lot of time talking about in a time when rates are going higher and bond prices are going lower, fixed income investors are losing money. They start to look for other ways to generate cash flow. And the large dividend growth ETFs and companies we think are going to lead fixed income for a long time Again, very close to making new relative strength high, relative strength versus the S&P, outperforming the market nicely. People are looking for yield. Again, this is a 3.6% yielder as an example, but all of these companies meet the types of tests that we're looking for uh, and make up our tactical income portfolio. So I put this up because we had a little strength uh, yesterday. We had a little strength the day before. Uh, today, we had a little strength in the morning. Um, we want to know when the market's been sloppy, what is it that is bucking the trend? So one of the things that we track are the, are the ETFs and companies that are making relative strength new highs versus the market. And I think it's a pretty simple story here. Out of about 1,600 ETFs, these were the only relative strength new highs today, XLE, Energy ETF. Uh, um, of Schwab large companies, fun, fundamentally sound large companies, Vanguard Energy ETF, AMLP, which is made up of pipeline uh, partnerships in the US, uh, Invesco Pure Value. You can see these themes are the themes that we've been talking about and they just continue to relatively outperform the Canadian uh, oil and gas capped energy index, uh, the Fidelity High Dividend uh, ETF. Just from a, from a uh, perspective standpoint, out of 1,600 ETFs, these were all of those ETFs that made relative strength new highs today, including the UNG natural gas. So no change to any of those themes. So positive on one side, negatives on the other. This is the QQQ made up of the largest tech stocks really in the world, breaking the lows from uh, February and March. Um, not to say that they can't turn around here, 
but I have to say the balance of evidence continues to be weaker. Uh, we had a very, very weak day on Friday for tech. And despite the fact we bounced a little bit early this week, really have only regained about half of what was given up on Friday. Relative strength continues to fall. This is a group that we're likely to continue to avoid and could underperform for quite some time. When we look at the point and figure chart that we use to help us identify inflection points where things are changing, you can see when it's pulling back, it's in a column of zeros, lower, low, lower, high, lower, low, lower, high, lower, low, testing that low a number of times, and then this week breaking that low. So this opens up measurement a little bit lower if the Fed uh, is a little more hawkish uh, on Fed day, it's possible that tech continue to weaken, but even on up days, it doesn't seem to have any uh, real uh, uh, gumption. So this is a group, again, that we continue to kind of be a little bit careful of. <clears throat> and within there, you have companies uh, in the software space, software ETF today on the lows. Uh, this is outside of tech, consumer continues to be weak. Uh, the consumer ETF down 21% uh, off the highs. Actually, a little bit more than that doesn't look like I picked the high here. <clears throat> but again, we came out of consumer discretionary some time ago, continues to be a very low weight. Nothing changing there, nothing changing in automation robotics, basically on the lows, uh, continuing to be weak. <clears throat> Communications continuing to be a very weak. So this continues to be a very bifurcated market, more growth-oriented securities underperforming, more value-oriented securities outperforming, yield being a very important uh, source of return to investors. And uh, after many years of underperformance, people looking for more inflationary asset versus growth assets. Financials. Financials, again, having a hard time getting off the carpet. So again, this has been a source of damage inside the S&P and one that we came out of over the last uh, 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 several months. So in the end, look, we have a very straightforward set of marching orders from our clients. Use the tools that we have to identify where money is being put to work and what has a tailwind, both fundamentally and technically. Look every day for change, that the, that, the, that the flows are changing, that there are new fundamental drivers and be prepared to make changes in the portfolios as we see those happen. And if things are weak from a breadth perspective, be prepared to sit on your hands. So it is a tactical approach. Here's how we look today. Energy continues to be the most a significant part of our portfolio. The world doesn't work without energy uh, and there is a finite amount of supply. We know that governments have been selling strategic supplies into the market, but inventories are not getting any better. Uh, this I think is gonna be an important asset to own. Uh, we do have some cash in the portfolio. Average portfolio has about 15% cash. We have some short-term government bonds because yields have risen in the short, in the short end. Uh, and we think that it's possible we're getting closer to where yields will be in, in two years from now. Uh, consumer staples for the dividend, you know, continue to be important. Materials we've taken down, not because we think that this materials trade is over, but if the market were to continue to weaken, it's a higher volatility area of the market. You know, this is a group that could correct some more. My own view, personally, as a strategist, is that likely on any strength, we're going to see these material stocks rally. Uh, but at the same time, as I said earlier, discretion is the better part of valor. Our number one job is not to lose the money. We got to keep a pretty defensive stance. Industrials continue to be a relatively small part of the portfolio, but it is largely defense focused. Utilities for the yield. Uh, technology, only 3% of firm assets, which is a very significant underweight. Certainly helping us. Financials at 2.5%. Communications at two and a half percent, real estate at two and a half percent, consumer discretionary almost non-existent. So it's a very skewed portfolio currently. We're skewed towards yield, we're skewed towards value, we're skewed towards inflation-oriented assets because we do believe that the world is moved into a more inflationary environment, likely to likely to stick for some time. Things that could help us. We know that the number of bulls currently or, or optimistic investors has really hit multi-year lows. And it's not impossible that the fever could break here and we get a little bit of respite. Um, but we're gonna have to see. 
we know that the put call ratio or the number of options investors who are buying puts as opposed to buying calls, or in other words, trying to hedge their portfolios is elevated. And we know that exposures in portfolios are relatively low. We know that yields have moved a long way and already probably reflect this tightening cycle. They certainly could correct. Oh, we missed a T. Positioning is more cautious. We know that investors' sentiment is weak. And we know that investors, both in hedge funds, institutional portfolios, and private investors, have reduced their risk exposure. We know that the put call ratio has been spiking. That often happens later in a in a correction. Um, and we think that a lot of the Fed news is in the market. Commodity prices continue to act like they're in a bull market. They're having short, sharp corrections, uh, but not breaking trend uh, and long-term moving averages moving higher. And finally, the VIX, which did move higher sharply in January and February, it's not made a new high in this most recent sell-off, which may be signaling that, um, that we're getting close to a nearer term bottom. We'll have to see step by step. So <clears throat> there are things that are positives. One of the key positives is the portfolios are holding in way better than the market. Another positive is we have not been caught in this fixed income sell-off. Another, another positive is we have cash that we can put to work as we see things start to turn. And I guess the last positive is we are not out over our skis. We have a very defensive stance in portfolios. We will get more defensive if it's required. And we'll just take this step by step. And day by day, the team is working very hard on making sure that we're keeping the portfolios uh, in tune with the market, uh, that we're not imposing our opinion. We're just using our tools to recognize what's actually happening. And that's all we can ever do. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly we can try and answer them. Hi, David. Thank you so much for such a great overview again. We don't have any questions that have come through this afternoon. Uh, so with that, I, I think we will let you get on to your much deserved vacation, safe travels. And if you want to leave with the final word, you're welcome to. Sure. Well, you know, Pam, I, I, I don't ever really turn off. And the funny thing is the that the, with the time change, uh, it'll be easy to, to do the morning work that we do. Um, we're going to be very interested to see how the market reacts this week to the Fed. Um, Diana and I have spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, there are key things we'd like to see. We'd like to see the markets hold the lows from earlier in the week. Um, if they if they break the lows, there's there's you know a few more things that we probably will do in the portfolios. Uh, but um, I'm pleased with the fact that you know we've we've incrementally shifted these portfolios quite dramatically over the last uh, number of months and weeks. Uh, and uh, if we can kind of stay in tune here, it's going to set up a very good opportunities when we do get some strength in the market. The, the history is that markets tend to correct into the beginning of a Fed tightening cycle. And then once it's telegraphed into the market, um, market can rally. We do think that the economy in the U.S. is very, very strong. Uh, we don't think it is uh, in a headed headed for recession. Um, markets are looking eight to nine months out, so obviously they're they're factoring in some risk of recession. But if the market really thinks there's going to be a recession or some kind of global slowdown, we're going to see it in commodity prices, and we're just really not seeing that at this point. So that's something that we're going to spend a lot of time focused on. Uh, and uh, and if there are major changes after the Fed's meeting. Uh, then we'll be back with a with an outbound message. Um, if people want to have a conversation uh, with one of our counselors, one of our, one of the counselors um, about their portfolios, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I I will be less available over the next week, uh, but certainly will be on deck uh, uh, following markets and and in communication with the team. So, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in today, and um, I, you know. <laughs> I'm working on a day and a half of scruff because I've been traveling for, for a little over a day. I had missed a couple of missed flights on the way here. So decided not to use the video today, but look forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon. Thanks so much, Dave. We look forward to having you back. Have a great trip and all the best. Thanks everyone. Okay. Thanks everyone for tuning in.